Airplane accidents are, of course, always tragic, but there are times when a set of circumstances causes a, a number of airplane accidents, more than one, to occur. It's something called a cluster, and while that compounds the tragedy, it also offers the opportunity to identify what's causing this cluster of accidents and hopefully remedy the situation to prevent future accidents. Such a cluster of accidents occurred in Washington's Mount Spokane State Park over a period of about two decades. All of the accidents were tragic, one particularly memorable because of the sheer number of casualties involved. It is history that deserves to be remembered. At 10.45 a.m. September 10, 1962, a KC-135 was starting its descent into Fairchild Air Force Base, 12 miles west of Spokane, Washington. The plane's call sign was Morn 79. The Boeing KC-135, nicknamed the Stratotanker, was the result of the Air Force's demand for a jet-powered aerial refueling tanker. The design was derived from the Boeing 367-80, commonly called simply the Dash 80, that Boeing had built as a proof-of-concept prototype to demonstrate the value of jet propulsion for passenger air service. Both the KC-135 and Boeing's first commercial jet airliner, the Boeing 707, were derived from the Dash 80. While their appearance is similar, the KC-135 predates the 707 and has a narrower fuselage and is shorter. Fairchild Air Force Base has a long history with the KC-135, with KC-135s having been stationed there as part of the 92nd Bombardment Wing since 1958, shortly after the KC-135 was introduced. Fairchild's first KC-135, named the Queen of the Inland Empire, set eight world records in September 1958, including most distance covered in a closed circuit without refueling, highest speed for 2,000 kilometers, and highest speed for 5,000 kilometers. Although it's primarily used as an aerial refueling tanker, the KC-135 has a cargo deck above the refueling system that can carry mixed passengers and cargo. Sometimes the plane is used for aeromedical evacuation. The normal crew is either three or four, depending on whether a navigator is required, but when it's configured for passenger travel, a KC-135 can carry up to 126 personnel. In the fall of 1962, Ellsworth Air Force Base in South Dakota was having its runway repaired. Some of their operations were being temporarily relocated to Fairchild. Morn 79 was from the 28th Air Refueling Squadron, assigned to Ellsworth Air Force Base, and the plane was being moved to Fairchild as part of the temporary relocation, along with personnel from air and ground crews. In addition to the four-person crew, the plane carried 38 airmen, B-52 Stratoforces Combat Crew and maintenance personnel from the Strategic Air Command's 28th Bomb Wing, as well as one civilian and one soldier. All told, the plane had 44 people aboard. While September is not the middle of the season for cloud cover in Spokane, in mid-January there's a roughly 74% chance of being overcast, it is not uncommon. In September, there's a roughly 1 in 3 chance of being overcast on a given day around Spokane. On September 10, 1962, flying weather in the Spokane area was poor, with a thousand foot cloud ceiling, rain, and areas of dense fog. In such conditions, where it isn't safe to fly by visual flight rules, pilots use instrument flight rules. The Morn 79 pilot, Captain Frank Johnson, a veteran of both World War II and Korea, was operating on instruments, following a standard flight approach shown on a map. The area around Spokane is mountainous, when the location for Fairchild Air Force Base, about 12 miles or 20 kilometers from the city of Spokane, was chosen in 1942. It was partially chosen because the Cascade Mountains offered a natural barrier to attack by Japanese forces. Flying around the mountains of Spokane can be very dangerous, especially in bad weather. On November 13, 1947, a B-29 Superfortress of the 343rd Bomb Group, called the Big Shmoo, stationed at what was then Spokane Army Airfield, was flying a routine training mission. Flying in formation with two other bombers in bad weather and heavy fog, Big Shmoo crashed into the side of the 5,883-foot Mount Spokane. Five crew died and five others were injured. Road crews pawing the road to a ski area were the first on the scene and took injured crew members to the ski lodge, where they could be transported to the hospital. The ski area named a ski run B-29 as a memorial to the men killed in the accident. The Big Shmoo was not the first plane to crash into Mount Spokane. In 1946, a single-engine AT-6 piloted by Spokane area used car dealer Rudolf Lanza crashed into Spokane Mountain. Lonza had been in Montana buying used cars for his dealership and was returning to Spokane Airport. 
What was extraordinary about the story is that Lanza was a very experienced pilot, a former Army Air Force instructor. Like the big schmoo, he had been approaching over the mountains in bad weather with poor visibility, although the plane may have lost altitude due to icing. Lost in remote territory, despite a large reward offered by his widow, it was over a year before the wreck and body were found. One of the mountains in the area is Mount Kit Carson, with an altitude of 5,286 feet, or about 1,600 meters. Mount Kit Carson is like Mount Spokane in Mount Spokane State Park, the largest of Washington's state parks. At approximately 11 a.m., Morin 79 was flying westbound in the vicinity of Meade, northwest of Spokane, at a reported altitude of 23,000 feet. The pilot contacted air traffic control at Fairchild Air Force Base for landing instructions and was directed to execute a right-hand turn and descend for landing. The pilots were relying on their instruments and their detailed map of the approach. The plane was traveling at about 230 miles per hour and the wheels were down, ready to land. At about 11.10, less than 10 minutes from landing, Morin 79 disappeared from radar. Fairchild Air Force Base and the county sheriff mounted a massive search, including helicopters and over 300 volunteers. A local man named Wayne Hammon heard about the search, either on the radio or television. He had hunted in the area and called his father Irving and a hunting buddy named Bert Smith and suggested they go search in the area where they hunted. They were driving up a hunting road on Mount Kit Carson when they smelled smoke. By then it was about four in the afternoon. They worked their way down a slope for about 50 yards when they came upon the wreckage. The crash site was horrific. Bert Smith was quoted as saying, I am glad that we didn't look any further than we did. I couldn't have looked any more. The plane had mowed down a huge swath of trees, 250 yards long and 25 yards wide. Colonel Floyd Cressman speculated that because of the weather, Captain Johnson had not seen the mountain until he was at treetop level, leaving no time to pull up. The plane smashed into the mountain. The 33,000 pounds of fuel on board ignited. All 44 on board were killed, burned beyond recognition. The number was staggering. To date, it was the deadliest crash ever of a KC-135, and is still the most lethal crash in the history of Spokane County, which has seen numerous plane accidents. A tandem tire lodged against a pine tree was the biggest piece of the plane left intact. A newsman on scene said that outside of the tires, the remaining pieces were small enough to put in your pocket. A Washington State Patrol officer, one of the first to reach the scene, described it as the worst sight I have ever seen. An accident investigation, including a special team from Norton Air Force Base in California, had the difficult task of reconstructing why Morin 79 had leveled out below 5,000 feet as it crossed Kit Carson Mountain. The conclusion was that the crash was primarily caused by a navigational error combined with the adverse flying conditions. The issue, according to the Spokane Spokesman Review, was that there were actually two flight paths into Fairchild Air Force Base, and they were very close together. One came around the mountains and had a minimum altitude of 4,500 feet. The other came over the mountain and had a minimum altitude of 8,000 feet. In the fog, there was no way to visually see that they were on the flight path over the mountain. It appears that Captain Johnson and his crew were under the impression that they were on the approach around the mountain and had leveled off to the wrong minimum altitude putting them on a path directly into Mount Kit Carson. In fact, the map for the, new, the two nearly identical approaches to Fairchild were on opposite sides of a single page. In addition, maintenance records for the two-year-old KC-135 showed that the radar had failed in nine of the plane's 11 previous flights, meaning that it was possible that the radar failed on this flight too. Morin 79 was not the last Air Force plane to crash in Mount Spokane State Park. January 19, 1967, another KC-135 on final approach to Fairchild Air Force Base in bad weather crashed into Mount Spokane, killing all nine people on board. It was the last accident of the cluster. Today, improved air traffic control procedures and improved aircraft instrumentation make such accidents far less likely, and according to the Air Force, Fairchild Air Force Base no longer uses the approach that goes over the mountains. But of course, accidents can still occur. In 1994, Fairchild Air Force Base's only remaining assigned B-52 bomber crashed while practicing maneuvers for an air show, killing all four people on board. But at least the circumstances that caused the cluster of accidents between 1946 and 1967 seem to have been remedied. 
In 1990, Frank A. Johnson, the son of the pilot of more than 79, returned to the ravine where his father's airplane crashed and collected some small debris. The Air Force gave him permission to bury that debris at the end of the runway at Fairchild Air Force Base, symbolically bringing the flight home to its final destination. The Air Force provided an honor guard for the service. The newspaper The Spokesman Review quoted Mr. Johnson about another visit to the valley where his father's plane crashed in 1997. He said, I spoke to my dad, brought him up to date on my life, our family, his grand and great grandchildren. It was a very emotional and yet rewarding time. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe. <laughs>